So hello everyone, I'm Elisa Peirano and I'm a member of Latinx staff in our Zoom with today's group with a working group on internet measurements. This will be mostly in English. Let me remind you that we have simultaneous interpretation both in the room and also remotely. With me is Massimo Candela. Buenos días. Buenos días a todos. Bien, así que como les digo, buenos días a todos. Vamos a comenzar entonces con las diapositivas. We are a bit late because uh, we are wa we were waiting for people coming back on the from the coffee break. It's also Friday. There we go. So, good morning, everybody. My name is Massimo Candela, and this is the Internet Measurement Working Group. Actually, this is the first session of the first Internet Measurement Working Group at LACNIC. Uh, last year, we did an experiment, and, but we were above. Uh, but this time, we are an official working group hosted by uh, LACNIC and LACNOC, which I thank. And uh, the goal of this working group is to um, create a bridge between uh, academics, researchers brought from university or uh, the private sector, and the operational world. And in particular, on the topics of, of course, internet measurements, network data analysis, network data collection, um, tools, uh, and these are the topics that we will talk today. With me, chatting with me, uh, there is the amazing Elisa Peirano, which uh, you saw before. Uh, she's an engineer uh, working since 2012 uh, with LACNIC. Uh, she's in uh, research and development department and uh, she works, uh, she focuses mostly on uh, analysis on internet resources and uh, interconnectivity in the LACNIC region. And there is me, Massimo Candela. I'm a principal engineer at NTT. We are a tier one, so transit and other services. Um, I mostly do their automation and monitoring of the network and uh, have been uh, contributing to the internet measurement research field and to, uh, with open source tools. Um, really important, since it is an official working group, uh, we have a mailing list. Um, and this is uh, the place where you want to write about uh, internet measurement research. You have questions, or if you want to, for example, send a survey, or you want to propose a project, this is where uh, we are planning to, um, to make the entire community uh, communicate around these topics. Uh, of course, it's a new mailing list, so for now, uh, there is not much, but uh, we are planning to make it grow. And we can go immediately uh, with the agenda. So um, I'm really happy to say, and really proud to say, and actually I have to admit, surprised, that uh, this is, for being the first time that we do this working group, we received a lot of uh, submission, a lot of presentations. Uh, so many that we, had to reject 70% of them, um, which is a, 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 well, sorry for that, but at the same time, it means that uh, we got some good amount of content and we were able to select uh, some good stuff. Also, uh, basically almost all of them were peer reviewed content, so uh, high quality content. And then we put together an agenda and uh, we have a special guest, Professor Fabian Bustamante. Um, then we have Pedro Botello Marcos, uh, Nurullah Demir, and last but not least, Agustin Formoso. And since the agenda is packed and we are already a bit late, we can go directly with the uh, first presenter, 
The first presenter, as I, as I said, is our special guest, Professor Fabian Bustamante. Fabian is a professor of computer uh, science at Northwestern University and director of, of research at Phoenix, a startup focused on delivering real-time video streaming at scale. His research is in network computer systems with current interest in computer networks at critical infrastructure, threats, and challenges. His research group has released tens of open source systems that together have gained over 1.5 million users worldwide. He is going to present weight in the criticality of the submarine cable network. Uh, Professor Bustamante, the stage is yours. He is going to be remote. environment, but there you go. Hard to get out of here. Uh, so yes, um, Fabian Bustamante, um, I feel conflicted now. O sea, mi nombre es Fabian Bustamante, hablo en castellano obviamente porque originalmente soy de Argentina. Eh, ahí. Y específicamente de ese pueblito de abajo, que es un pueblito, una ciudad como Rivadavia. So I'm going to go back and forth. I don't know how I can do this or if I can do this well. But anyway, I'm from Argentina uh, and originally from this um, relatively small town in the middle of Patagonia. Um, I thought it was a good way of using the map. And I've been here in Northwestern for, God knows, 21 years or something like that. If um, I came to the States to get my PhD and and they are basically uh, staying <laughs> for good. Um, so let me go into the talk briefly. The work that I'm going to talk about a little bit is the research that we've been doing for the last few years on what um, on the submarine cable network, trying to understand this. But before that, let me tell you a little bit about my research so this fits into some larger context. My work is mostly on internet scale computer networks and distributed systems, and Massimo said. And it's largely experimental. Uh, we build systems and we evaluate them. Uh, the range of topics I have worked on, it's all over the map. Um, I'm a problem of attention here. The, um, Is the video back? All right. Professor, your video was frozen for a few seconds, but also we are not able to see your presentation. I don't know if you shared it. I did. Um, something happened with the... Now no, your video is back anyway. Just the presentation is missing. Okay. Sorry about that now. All right. Sorry about that. Something happened with the computer last went off. Nice. Um, so what I was saying, uh, the video was off, so the presentation was there. There's not much there. I was just talking about the context of my research that I do on large scale networks and systems, primarily with experimental focus. I have work in a range of topics from P2P to IPX and broadband and vehicular networks. Uh, but today, most of the work that we do is on internet survivability for the last few years, at least, and looking at the threat, challenges, possible responses to this. Much, uh, or rather, everything that I do is on, driven by this comment from Feynman that I love. Uh, and this is why everything that we do is experimental. I don't believe in anything unless you can throw me that it, show, that it actually works in the field. And so it's this new, as a test of all knowledge and the just, this only judge of scientific truth, as Feynman says so well. Uh, briefly, why internet measurements, as is, I guess that quote gives you an idea. Mainly the focus is on internet measurement because I believe that access is power, as most of you there. And I don't see any other way than for the rest of the world outside the single operators to evaluate, experiment, measure the network to understand its evolution and the impact that it has in society as a whole. 
And when I do this, I mean looking at it from every service and every network around the world, and not just from the core, as it used to be the common focus of research in the field, but from the edges and up the stack all the way to the end user. And trying to move beyond observation, beyond basic measurement studies, trying to bring some experimentation approaches to this to the field. I think that problem of capturing a wide perspective from everybody's focus beyond observation this cannot be more clear than in the context of the submarine cable network. This network, it's a very complex, large scale network of over 500 cables that overall cover 1.8 million kilometers of the world seabeds. If each of these cables is very expensive, uh, an FTP deploy cable of 6,000 kilometers coming up uh, at the end of this year, I think it was, uh, connecting Vietnam to ACL is going to cost a few million dollars, as you can see. And this infrastructure in, you know, is known to be critical, both for connectivity of the world as a whole and the economies. The threat that this experimental, this experimentation platform is facing, my God, it's going to give me nuts. Uh, I seem like to cut myself again. All right. The threat that this network is facing uh, are the usual human stupidity, cyber warfare and natural disaster, but those numbers and the number of natural disaster and the scale of them is just being scaling very rapidly. I think you're all aware everything you read in the news is telling you basically pretty much the same. There are about 100 cables that break a year. Repairing any of these cables is incredibly expensive. And in the two, three million dollars on average, and it can take up to 20 days. Despite the criticality and the fragility of the network and the increased number of threats, there's really not much research in this space. Uh, if you look at the key conferences in the field, CECOM, Infocom, Hotnet, IMC, there's basically very few papers overall over the years, and most of them are ours. Uh, we lack a real understanding of its criticality and the cost of any of this disruption. We don't understand how the faults manifest. In the early days, a break of the cable is going to show up as you got disconnected. If you think about it, for the last few years, we've seen an increase in the number of on the the number of cables and the redundancy on the infrastructure across the layers. That redundancy translates into basically the faults are not now clear shut faults where you just have a hard fall where the cable gets disconnected. And you lose connectivity, but, but really what you see is increasingly number of what we call soft failures. Loss in performance because you have to be rebounded, for instance. And of course, there is no global infrastructure that monitors this framework. Uh, we've been using everything, looking glass, red atlas, whatever we can find. But really, there's nothing dedicated to monitor this infrastructure that is as critical as we, as we discussed. So a few years back, we proposed a research agenda focusing on this specific area. Uh, one of the key things that we need to figure out how to do is how to pick through the layers of the network. And what is an opaque network and increasingly more opaque where MPLS is all over the map. People don't respond to a CMP and your TLS get, you know, your TTLs get modified all the time. They, once we understand this network and being able to map them, we try to understand what is the relative criticality of any of these cables and understand that what matters most and where you should invest and or if you have a problem in your particular region. And then with this information, trying to figure out how to build this monitoring system that is so badly needed. Looking at that in, you know, and to the problems that we face for this, you can include the fact that any monitoring infrastructure relies on some constancy on the performance of that thing that you monitor. Because the way you work, you basically monitor the thing and you find some threshold 
over which you call and you know and you know have a raise an alert. But that assumes that this constancy on the performance that we have seen in the submarine cable uh, world that actually doesn't hold anymore. But let me tell you a little bit uh, about the specific work that we've been doing in the last couple of years. In my very simplified model of the world, uh, and I believe from the papers I've seen that it's a very common thing, the way I was going to go about finding criticality of the, identifying the criticality of any particular cable was to look at a lot of trade routes as going to map the trade route to some submarine cable by basically identifying one link that was going to be significantly longer than the rest. I was going to look at the routers, map the routers down, find the router that is closest to a landing point, and there you go, there's a cable. Really, what we found is that it's a lot messier than that. For instance, this is a very long haul link. This is in a trade route, a single hop in the trade route that goes from Singapore to Seattle and relies on three different cables. One of them actually tiny on the Japan Information Highway. There's no clear way to map this. Uh, and this is not a rare thing. There is a large number of these long haul links, partially due to virtualization of the infrastructure. And three cycles of KDA ARC data, we found 85,000 of them. Okay. The graph that you see there is a CDF, and I hope you can read the CDF, uh, of the interrouter uh, RTT of both the interconnected intercontinental submarine cable segment and the long haul link that hop on the trade route. And you can see in the intercontinental segment is about 70 milliseconds in the median case, but it's 130 milliseconds in the long haul link. So these long haul links are twice as long as the underlying infrastructure that, we, that they rely on. So much for my idea. In the 70 percentile, it's 1.5 times. The other part of that simplified, very simple model they had was that the, there was a router that was close to the landing point that would help me identify which cable you were using. Obviously, that's definitely not the, that's not the case. We found a lot of them being very far away from them, some of them 500 kilometers away from the landing point, and even a few thousand kilometers away from the landing point. If you are an operator working in this space, perhaps this is not surprising. For anybody in the research community, this is still badly understood. Obviously, what you see here, and one of the things is the, you know, besides virtualization, is the fact that the actual router is being moved all the way to the pop in the data center. In this case, you know, in many of these cases, like in places like Chicago, where we have no submarine cable nearby. So to understand this criticality of the submarine cable network, I need to figure out how to map those cables. And why do I care about the criticality? Because everybody knows what the problem is and everybody has an idea of how we actually should go and spend money on either reinforcing infrastructure or building a system that allows us to repair it. But all these ideas are very expensive. And so we have to figure out where is that you're gonna put your money. We have no measure of this criticality, so we came out with some measures of them. Uh, one of them is rather stress, and then we have a couple of the right metrics of rather stress. But the rather stress idea is very straightforward. It is a fraction of routes that rely on a given cable. So if I look at all the trade routes, I want to see the fraction of, the, of those trade routes that rely on, submarine cable, on the submarine cable network that rely on a specific cable. Okay. Of course, this requires me to be able to map, which as I show you, is a little challenging, a trade route to a particular submarine cable, or one or more submarine cables. So this is what we've been doing for the last few years. This is a trade route to give you an idea of the steps that we follow. It goes from Perth to Rio, right? And it jumps with one of these long haul links that you can see over there between Sydney 
and Rio de Janeiro in one part. No need, yeah, you don't need me to tell you that there is no cable that connects directly Perth with you know Rio, Sydney with Rio. So what we do is we build in a number of assumptions. We build an intermediate hub in the US. We identify the domestic route of these guys. And we lay out the path and the physical infrastructure that is being followed by this trade route. The long haul link that I, saw, that I show you on the 300 milliseconds goes from Perth to Rio de Janeiro. That's the dash line. And what you see in color is the actual path and the physical infrastructure that this route follows. Why do you care? Once I have this, now I can compute the route stress of any place. I can figure out how many of these trade routes depend, you know, rely on a particular submarine cable, and that's how important the submarine cable is. We wanted to look at this in different places. We have looked at, you know, places all the way, all around the world and different, you know, like seas and countries. I just want to show you one case because I don't have a lot of time. This is the case of South Africa. South Africa has seven landing points and about eight cables. Where are you going to invest your money if you are the South African government in protecting these cables? We compute the route of stress of these guys, and that's what you see on the graph down there. The three cables dominate the connectivity of South Africa according to the data that we have used on. That's basically all coming from KDAN. Our West Africa, the ACT, WAC, and the WASC. Those three cables out of the eight cables they have are the most important cables that they have. Sadly, by the way, all of those cables have landed on the west coast of Africa. Where do you see this matter? Uh, the second time in, I think, three years, there, is, there was a landslide and the sea landslide in the Congo Canyon uh, in uh, August 6th of this year. And Doug reported this in September. Very nice article if you have not seen it. This landslide basically is coming because of the rains in the you know in the continent it produced a landslide over the Congo Canyon where many of these cables are coming coming across. Two of them, so they SAT3 and WACS got cut an hour from each other. Those are the two two of the three main cables South Africa rely on. Doug Mallory reported one of this, you know, this cable as in one of the articles that Kendrick has out there. This reflected on 150 to 195 millisecond increase on the latency to London of one of these sensors. Because, as I said, this is not a hard failure, it's a soft failure that, that translates, presumably, on a rerouting on the, other, on the east coast of Africa to avoid the problem that they that came out from this landslide. In summary, this research agenda that we've been working on, that we proposed a few years back and been working on, focuses on understanding the internet as a critical infrastructure and focusing particularly on the submarine cable network. The threats it has and the possible responses that we have. To understand this requires an understanding of the physical organization and this dependency of networks and resources. But I think most critically for this audience, it depends on you. It's a challenge for a network, you know, for a researcher in networking to go through this mapping of trade routes down to infrastructure to understand or validate any of this work. I have friends likely in a few of the larger players, and so we've been able to go back and check with Cloudflare or Telefonica. But I really need the help from everybody. And given the criticality of this infrastructure that you guys build on, it's key for society as a whole that we work in teams to both understand the criticality, the importance, and figuring out how to map or locate our resources. And that's it. This is really me talking, but the work has been done by my collaborators, uh, including Paul Barford from Wisconsin-Madison. 
And my students, I promise students that you see listed there, Zach Bishop, who's at Georgia Tech, Stephen Calissimo, Romain Fontaine, a bunch of other people. And that's it. Been out. Sure. See. Uh, so, um, I've been doing this kind of, uh, analysis of looking at, uh, trying to understand submarine cables from large amounts of trace routes for, uh, many years, uh, going back to, you know, the, spotting the, sub, the, the Alba one submarine cable activation all the way up to the St. Helena activation this past week. Um, I would say that it's, the task is really difficult because, uh, there's, there's, um, you have to do a lot of inference. And I would say it's actually gotten a lot harder over the years. So when I was doing this 10 plus years ago, you could make more assumptions around uh, the telecom that had invested the most into a cable was probably the one using it. And then you could, these days, uh, I would say it's, it's way more complicated because uh, telecoms will have backup links on competing cables. So when a cable goes out or like you, it, it becomes much more complicated to do even the inferences. Um, Having said that, um, we should get together, and I would love to uh, chat with you. Uh, and I've um, got a lot of ideas of, of ways you could take this research. Absolutely, I, I would love. I mean, I love the work that you have been doing for all these years, and we clearly we follow you. Okay. So yes, definitely. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Ante, gracias por su tiempo. Un placer. Saludos. Ahora tendremos a Pedro de Botelio Marcos, es profesor en la Universidad Federal de Río Grande, Brasil. Él mide las interacciones entre las entidades que componen el Internet y obtiene información importante para apoyar las toma decisiones, va a hablar sobre las propiedades de conectividad en los IXPs de América Latina. Muchas gracias por la presentación, Elisa. Voy a presentar uh, nuestro trabajo, el trabajo que estamos realizando en sobre las IXPs. Es un joint work with one of my students, Joaquín, que está también aquí. Así que, déjame empezar con something that may seem sound quite obvious to you that our operators that traffic delivery is a fundamental aspect of the internet operations today you are constantly needing to handle increasing traffic volumes the application requirements regarding packet loss latency jitter and etc and what you are trying to do or the way that you try to solve those requirements and address those problems is with routing and interconnection and IXPs are an essential element in this process. In fact, we have many, many IXPs around the world where you can connect, especially right now where we have remote peering components that allow you to connect everywhere. And only in Latin America, according to LAC AX, we have more than 100 IXPs where each one of them are offering different opportunities to improve routing and traffic delivery. So, Our goal on this talk is to contribute to the understanding of the connectivity properties in Latin America. What we are going to show today are preliminary results regarding AS members that are part of the IXPs, the prefix and routes that those AS's are announcing at the IXPs. Also, we are going to show some results regarding ge geographical coverage of the IXPs. And finally, we are going to show how the ASs that are present at multiple IXPs in our region are using traffic engineering to give preference to one, one IXP or the other. But before I start talking about the results themselves, I need to provide some details about the data sets that we are going to use in our analysis. First, we are going to analyze IX.BR Sao Paulo and Fortaleza in Brazil also Cabazi, Argentina, and PIT, Chile. So th those are probably the four top IXPs in Latin America. And to get data from those IXPs, what we did is that we relied on the looking glass from those uh, 
IXPs using the Alice API or Telnet to get data. Also, whenever that data is not available, we relied on data from PCH in, to get the routes. The results that we are going to show here today are from September 16 this year. And to provide geographical information about the prefix that those uh, IXPs are uh, receiving, we relied on data from MaxMind, and thanks, Carlos, for providing access to us to that data set. So it starts with the members and the countries of the IXPs. Here there is like a plot where there is three bars for each of the IXPs, one representing the total members at the IXPs, one for the members that are announcing IPv4 prefixes, one for the members that are announcing IPv6 preference. And I need to highlight here that we are only considering the members that are announcing at least one route at the route server. So that's why numbers from Sao Paulo are around 2,000 and not 2,400, for example. So it's OK. Sao Paulo is the largest one, followed by Sierra Fortaleza, Cabazi, and PT Chile in terms of members. Uh, one interesting thing that we identified here is that the proportion of members are announcing IPv6 routes in, in Argentina is smaller than when compared to the other uh, IXPs. And regarding the countries of the members, it depends on the IXP, but it can be between 10 and 32 members announcing routes at the IXP. In all the cases, the most popular country is the country of the IXP, which is quite obvious. Local ASs connect to the IXP to exchange routes, followed by the United States because we have the CDNs and the other cloud providers that are connected there to exchange traffic. Going to the AS is that we can reach via the IXP. So basically, the AS is that we can, that are propagating routes via one of the members of the IXP. We have the numbers here, again, for two bars for each IXP, one for V4, one for V6. One thing that's quite interesting here is that Fortaleza has about one-fourth of the members that are connected to Sao Paulo but the customer cone of the IXP is almost the same when compared to Sao Paulo. And this is because there is a hurricane electric connected to both IXPs, so the reachability of both is almost the same despite the high number, the, uh, the large difference between the number of members. And also that for Chile, the cone for V4 is almost the same size of Sao Paulo and Fortaleza, and Chile has less members than both of the Brazilian IXPs but the V6 cone is quite smaller compared to the IPv4 cone for Chile. So there are many ASs announcing V4 routes at Chile, but not IPv6 routes. Regarding where are the prefixes of the members and the customer cone of the IXPs and the amount of prefixes, what we can observe here is that Sao Paulo is, is the largest one, followed by Fortaleza, and for V4 we have uh, Chile. Regarding the countries in Brazil for the prefixes that are being visible at the route server of those IXPs, both um, Sao Paulo and Serra, we have Brazilian prefixes and prefixes that are geolocated to the United States. And as, as I said before, we did the geolocation uh, relying on MaxMind. So this is the inference from MaxMind database. For Cabazi, most prefixes are located in Argentina, followed by Brazil, again, both for V4 and V6 prefixes. And for Chile, we have some difference for the IPv4 prefixes. Most prefixes are in the United States, followed by Brazil. And for IPv6, most prefixes are in Brazil, followed by Chile. So this is quite surprising for, for us. Uh, regarding, now we are going to focus on the part of traffic engineering. In our analysis, we have identified that many prefixes are being announced at multiple IXPs. So we decided to compare, compare first where can we find shorter routes to reach those prefixes. So first I will show the results for IPv4 and then later for IPv6. Here we have like six bars comparing all the pairs of IXPs that we can have, like both Brazilian, Sao Paulo and Argentina, Sao Paulo and Chile, and so on. And we have three different colors for each bar. Blue one is that the paths have the same size in both IXPs. The red one is that in our IXP on the left, so the left flag is shorter, and 
the yellow ones, the right flag is shorter. And in the top of the bars, we have the number of prefixes that are visible in both IXPs, so the ones that we are comparing right now. First ones that when we compare the Brazilian ones among them and with the IXP from Chile, that path size is the same for almost all the prefixes that are being announced there. But when we compare the three IXPs with the Argentinian one, the Argentinian one always not, but in most cases has longer paths to the prefix that are available in both locations. If we check these same results for V6, what we have is that the number of prefixes that are announced in both IXPs is quite smaller, and in fact, only in the Brazilian IXPs we have like a large number of prefixes that are present in both for IPv6, and the path size is the same, and this is mostly because there is like a tier one connected in there announcing the same prefix in both locations, so it's a member announcing the same prefix. Going back to, or, or, I mean, continuing with the traffic engineering practice, this first analysis, we are trying to understand if ASs that are connected to multiple IXPs are trying to prefer one IXP or the other to exchange traffic. And here we are trying to infer this with the, the data that we have. So basically we can infer the use of AS path prepending, we can infer the use of selective announcements and the use of more specifics. We cannot infer the use of BGP communities and we cannot infer the MAD values. So our analysis may be a little bit limited in this scope. But first the results for IPv4. Again, we have all the pairs of IXPs. We have the number of ASs that are present in both locations. And we have four different columns. The first one is about no visible preference. So we are basically seeing the same prefix with the same AS path length for all the prefixes in both locations. Or the AS is always giving preference to IXP A for the prefix, or always giving preference to IXP B, or sometimes it's preferring the IXP A, sometimes it's preferring the IXP B. Here we have the numbers. There are two important things that we can highlight here. First is, the, is that whenever one AS is given preference to an IXP, it tends to be the largest one in terms of members and prefixes. So in all the cases here, the ASs are preferring the largest one or the most ASs are preferring the largest one, but there are also many cases where AS sometimes are preferring one of the IXPs, sometimes the other IXP. And for V6, we also observed similar results where either you prefer the largest one or sometimes you prefer one, sometimes you prefer the other. The next part of the analysis that we are going to show is which techniques the ASs are using to uh, set the preference for one IXP or the other. Remember that we can only infer the use of path prepending, selective announcements, and more specific prefixes. So popular traffic engineering techniques at IXPs considering IPv4. Again, similar table, all the pairs of AXPs, but now we have seven different columns the AS can, be, uh, can use a single technique like only AS path prepending, only more specifics, only selective, or any combination of two, two techniques, or also using all techniques combined to provide some preference to one IXP or the other. What we have identified here is that except for the comparison between the two Brazilian IXPs, AS tend to use selective announcements or a combination of more specifics and selective announcements to give preference to one IXP or the other. But at the Brazilian IXP, what we have observed is that there are a couple of different possibilities that the ASs are using. And in most cases, they are using a single technique and the most popular ones, more specific prefix, followed by selective announcements and then followed by Prepending. Also, there are five ASs that are using all three techniques to give preference to a particular IXP. For IPv6, we also did this analysis, and again, it's the same table, but for the IPv6 ASs. For all the combinations except the Brazilian ones, it's the same results from uh, our preview analysis. And for the combination of Brazilian IXPs, again, same result, 
only one technique, more specifics, followed by selective and followed by prepending. But for IPv6, we haven't found any AS given preference to, or using all the techniques to indicate preference. So in summary, we have identified so far about connectivity in Latin America is that members are mostly from the country of the XP, followed by ASs that are located at the, based on the United States, but not necessarily located there. In general, prefixes that are being announced at multiple XPs have the same AS path length, but there are ASs that are connected to multiple XPs and trying to indicate preference with traffic engineering for one XP or the other. And to do that, ASs are using either selective announcements or more specifics, or in some cases, a combination of multiple techniques to do that. And with that, I conclude my question, my talk, and I'm more than happy to take your questions. Feel free to ask in Portuguese, English, or Spanish. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pedro. So, do we have questions? Questions? Nobody has questions. Are you sure? Last, last option for a question. <laughs> then, okay. okay. Then, uh, thank you very much for your, uh, for your presentation. And uh, we go straight to the next presenter. The next presenter, an applause. So the next presenter is Nurul Ademir. He is going to join us remotely. And um, Nurul is a cybersecurity, almost died. Nurul is a cybersecurity researcher at the Institute for Internet Security in Germany. His research focuses on web security, privacy, and web measurement. In addition to his research work, he actively contributes as an analyst and author to open source projects like uh, the project HTTP Archive. A big welcome. The stage is yours, and he will present reproducibility and replicability of web measurement studies. Um, hello? Hello? Yeah. Nurula? Sí, te oímos. Bueno, porque se acaba de caer el Zoom, no sé por qué. Pero espero que por lo menos pueda. You can see my presentation and me and hear me. Um, can I please get the feedback if you can hear me or see me and my presentation? Hello? Okay. Um, great. Um, hello. Thank you for having me today. My name is Nurla Timir. I'm Dr. Cybersecurity Researcher at Institute for Internet Security. Today I present um, one of our study on exploring the complexity of the web and its impact um, on the web measurements that mainly really on the paper um, you published um, last year at the web um, conference. Um, so, um, the web measurements help us to understand, identify, quantify the trends, threats, and um, determine the current challenges on the web. And, and to conduct such measurements, we have various techniques, method, methodologies, uh, strategies. And, and additionally to this, we so our modern web is too dynamic. And in this dynamism, we want to understand, to find answers um, 
how comparable the web measurement studies um, are and to which extent the web measurements can be reproduced or replicated. And our contributions, um, our contributions um, are in summary, um, we have created guidelines for web measurements and performed survey on 117 uh, papers published on top tier conferences. And to increase the comparability of web measurements, um, we perform experiments utilizing 25 different measurement setups and compare the results and differences. Um, so firstly, some definitions. Um, and, uh, we have major principles such as uh, reproducibility, replicability or repeatability that are underpinning the scientific um, method. Um, according to ACM, uh, repeatability of an experiment uh, made by same team and same experimental, experimental setup and replicability is made by different team and same um, experimental setup and replicability is made by different team and different experiment, experimental set, setup. So we leave repeatability aside, um, reproducibility and replicability of our, so uh, these are essential to our analysis and as this um, enable us to verify the and compare results of existing uh, works. Um, so um, uh, we first performed a literature survey on papers published at top tier conferences, security conferences. In our SUCOP, we had uh, 117 um, papers to be analyzed in depth. Um, we then created best, best practices based on survey papers and our own experiences on this research area. And because of the limited time, I want to give the details uh, for each practice and our guideline. You can find it in our paper. Um, so the Categories in our guidelines uh, were, um, so we had three main uh, groups, data set, experiment um, design, and um, experiment environment. Um, so I can give some highlights on survey results. Um, we determined that 64% of the papers state the, the, data set, the um, data set they used, like if they use um, top list Alexa or Tranco. However, 73 of them don't offer um, a complete list of the analyzed page. That, um, so this makes uh, it impossible to reproduce uh, the experiment because, because they, we missed the uh, the web page that um, have been analyzed. So, and we see that 31% of papers um, don't state which technology they use, like if they used um, Selenium or Curl or um, other frameworks for the crawling or measurement. And a nice thing, uh, a nice thing is that about 76% um, um, of the papers described uh, the data processing uh, pipeline. Um, so, uh, on the evaluation um, side. Um, we see that 64% of the papers omit the, an ethical discussion like potential consequences of the crawling um, and only 24% of the papers make their results or raw data uh, publicly available. Um, so we now turn to replicability of studies uh, to demonstrate the impacts. We have decided to choose uh, these four criteria um, because literally we don't see enough evidence on, on this uh, for uh, criteria, so we don't see any impact. Uh, and, um, and the first one is uh, what happens when we perform multiple measurements um, instead uh, just one. Um, and the second one is which differences would we get when we don't uh, name the crawling technology or the method we utilize that in our measurements. Um, also. And um, also impact of um, mimicking user interaction. And our last study was to determine the effects of the crowd's location. This, has, this is already discussed, uh, discussed um, point in other related works. And in our work, we wanted to show if we can replicate results of um, previous uh, works. Um, we have created totally 25 uh, virtual machines, uh, machines and assigned each of them a different uh, configuration. We run our measurement in three different locations, Europe, North America, and Japan, and in each location, distinct uh, Firefox and Chrome profiles, and um, also distinct headless mode of these both profiles. Um, this, um, all four profiles are without any user interaction. That means we just visit the web pages, and we have it. Um, 
added for all these profiles an alternative profile uh, with user interaction that are simulating simple simple key uh, events like page down, page up, um, tap um, buttons. Um, so finally, we had in each location eight profiles and, and totally 24 uh, profiles. Our 25 uh, profile was a repeated a profile that visit each day same web pages to check if measurement uh, results can be changed um, daily. And some other information on our study, um, maybe I skip this, you can find the test because we have limited times. Um, so um, now we can discuss our, um, our, our results on, on replicability. And so here in, uh, uh, so here in the box plot, um, you can see, um, you can see uh, the black box as the um, as the tracking requests um, and distinct trackers in in white uh, box um, uh, for each profile. Uh, when we compare the prof the Firefox with Chrome profiles, um, we generally see Chrome based profiles make two percent um, more traffic. Interestingly, we can see the here um, that Firefox profiles. Um, has 12% more tracking requests um, than the Chrome, although um, Chrome profiles uh, have had also had um, always more requests. And um, so now the, we analyze the impact of um, of user interaction while crawling. So what happens when we mimic user interaction on the page? We see an average 20% um, um, more traffic on profiles with interaction, and the Chrome profiles with interaction record an increase of um, 6%, while uh, Firefox profiles have increase of um, 36%. Uh, and a very interesting finding was here that the volume of the tracking requests in new requests um, were very differently. So that means we were more uh, tracked. Um, um, so, and when we interact uh, on the websites, we have also seen new distinct trackers. Um, so, we now compare the results of measurements on different locations. Uh, overall, we see that um, USA profiles are uh, tracked uh, at most in terms of distinct trackers, uh, followed by Japan and um, EU. Um, we believe that local liberations. Um, is the root um, cause for that. And when we check the volume of the tracking requests, uh, we get also um, the same sequence. Um, so our results are very consistent with the related work on this uh, topic. Remember that we wanted to show, show if we can replicate um, with this study, the results of the previous uh, works. Um, so um, our last profile was, um, has visited the same pages for 12 days. As you can see here, the number of tracking requests can be daily very up to 12%, while the number of uh, distinct trackers stays almost stable. Those studies that analyze the ecosystem will find similar results, while studies that aim to analyze the extent um, of a tracking phenomenon might see different results based on the uh, measurement um, they so this this shows how important repeated measurements um, are to draw more robust uh, conclusions and to summarize our survey shows um, studies of um, often don't document as the experimental setup so they cannot be rep reproducible uh, reproduced or replicable and um, we have also developed a guideline for designing and conducting web measurement studies, so I mean robust web measurement studies, and run also an extensive measurement setup where we also evaluate our own um, guideline. Um, so finally, we, we need uh, to find ways for performing more robust uh, web measurements, um, and we have just um, published a follow-up paper um, on this topic and that we will present in a few in a few weeks um, at IMC um, 23, where we conduct some other analyze, analysis on the root cause of different differences when we run um, web measurements. Um, so thank you very much. Um, Anurula. 
Yo tengo una pregunta, Nurula. En tu estudio... ¿Esto puede generalizarse para un espacio de aplicación más amplio? We analyzed the core elements of the web, um, like HTTP network traffic um, or HTTP resource uh, elements. So that's why we believe that uh, it has a broader, um, it has potential for the broader uh, application spatial. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for me. Bye. Thank you very much. el desarrollo de RIPE-STAT, así como la creación de pipelines de datos y visualizaciones de datos en RIPE. Atlas va a hablar sobre la conectividad en la región LACNIC 2023. Bueno, hola. My slides are in English, but I will make my presentation in Spanish. Thank you to the chairs for starting with this, which I think is very important for the region. I think it's important to bring quality content. I'm Agustin Formoso. I work for RIPE, but this study was done on a personal basis. It's a collaboration that we did together with LACNIC. My presentation is based on a much larger study. They tell me I don't have so much time for my presentation, so let me give you the highlights of this study. And hopefully this is of interest to you, and you can then read this report. This document is part of the technical reports of the R&D area of LACNIC. This is a connectivity study that is also in line with connectivity studies that were conducted previously and that were launched in previous editions. The previous studies were based on latency, but in this edition, we have added other dimensions such as paths, IXPs, and other data sources that allow us to have a better vision of the connectivity. The goal of this document is to provide actionable information at network operator level to make this act as a trigger so that the operators take action and above all to obtain feedback from the operators to see whether what we see in the study is in line with the reality, with the operational reality. Now, very briefly, let me tell you about this. We launched a measurements campaign with ICMP trace routes, and this was done from software probes running on mobile devices from that platform. We launch about 1,500 networks in the region, and this was with speed test servers that are in most of the operators. With this aim, we did a little trick. Uh, DINS, our targets were always a domain name, country dot uh, zone, where we're conducting the experiment. When we start doing DNS queries, the IP behind changes. So this was a practical way of doing this at a large scale. Here, I'm just going to show you the results at country level. Now, what was the methodology we followed? Basically, we used trace routes, and then we followed the trace routes with each hop. For those hops where we had an answer, for which we had an IP address that answered something, we did the following. We wanted to determine the network behind that IP address. In the case of the ASNs, we went to RIPE's RIS, and we checked the route that was announcing that prefix. And in the case of IXPs, we went to peering DB, specifically to the IX prefix field, so that we could determine whether this IP was part of the IP prefix that was included in PMDB. 
In addition to the network, we added information on the country, which was one of the important topics of the study, which I will be sharing with you now. Now, how did we add that country information? The first thing was to try to determine which were the requirements of this at geolocation level. One of the objectives was to see when the trace routes crossed the borders between countries. For us, it was enough to know in what country that IP was located. We didn't need to have geolocation information that had to be super precise at country level. But geolocation turned out to be quite a challenge. We used five data sources for the purpose of geolocation. These are listed from greater to lesser reliability. The first one are networks that we know are working, and we see these in the trace routes. These are networks like Akamai, Level 3, Cloudflare, which we know operate in several countries. Then we consulted the GeoFeed service of LACNIC to see what IP addresses the operators state that operate in certain countries. We also got the information from RIPE IP map, which is a geolocation information based on active addresses. Then there were some cases that we were not so sure about. There were some trace routes or there were some pings from, for example, Argentina to the United States with 20 milliseconds. So we did a bit inference based on latency specifically for this study. And in the event of those data sources not giving us anything, we checked the registry information. Based on the visualization, what I wanted to share with you was that although one can check several geolocation sources, to a large extent, this information ended up coming from the registry information. So once we processed all the information, we started to plot graphs such as these. We have a trace route based on the IP data. We started to process the adjacent hops between the different autonomous systems. So we could then start processing the links in the graph. In the graph, we see each node. The node depends on how central the node is, and each color is one of the countries we obtained from the geolocation mechanisms. For those nodes that are fully painted, these are ASNs. And those that are white in the middle are IXPs. This is a case of Argentina with the two major nodes, Telecom and Cabase, which we see are large and are located in the central part of this graph. Then we have other examples. This is a case of Chile with a strong presence of NIC Chile. And then some global networks that we saw in some of the trace routes. In the case of Mexico, with a couple of IXPs and a lot of connectivity between different ASNs, that was in line with our expectations. In the case of Bolivia, None of the trace routes we saw came from Bolivia. So this was one of the indicators of a good health in terms of routing in a country and the presence of PIT Bolivia, the IXP of Bolivia. And this slide is sort of uh, shifted, but this ranks 10 networks. The percentage you see is a trace route percentage that went through each of these networks. And in Argentina, the documents has, have rankings for each of the countries. Here we have similar information to the one we saw in the graph showing Telecom and Cabase at top of the list with quite a high percentage in terms of IXPs. We wanted to focus on this in our study, when we look at the trace route percentage that goes through the IXP of that country, in other words, that they really use the IXP in that country, we saw values, typical values of above 40 percent, which we considered was quite healthy. So it's quite a high use of the IXP. In general terms, IXPs are at the top of the country rankings. Now, there were two cases where this was not aligned with our expectations. And these are the cases of Brazil and Chile with a strong presence of the IXPs, where it was a low percentage in this graph. Now, 
This doesn't speak so much about Brazil and Chile, but rather of the platform where there is a platform towards the mobile aspect of this. So when we looked at the trace routes and we analyzed the latency information, we wanted to see if there was any difference between the trace routes that go through and do not go through an IXP. And also to see the curves that have a slight difference. The black curve is closer to the lower trace routes compared to the gray one. So this is an indication that going through an IXP in general terms is at a lower latency price. In the case of Bolivia, for the lower latencies, there were similar curves. But when we look at the higher percentiles of the curve, we start detecting differences. This might be like quality of service. This is the case of Panama. There were quite significant differences here. And to start to close my presentation, I wanted to mention something regarding data quality. It's great to have many data sources, but the more the sources, the greater the number of errors you introduce. I spoke about geolocation. Then we have active measurements that have a bias towards mobile operators and very poor IPv6 support. We heard in the conference the quote, if you're not in PNDB, you don't exist. And this is a case for our report. We have the vision provided by PNDB regarding the data. And also, I referred to special cases, which were namely Brazil and Chile. Now, this is the very first edition of some reports. This was done at country level, but we also wanted to check connectivity between countries. We'd also like to know from you if there are other metrics, and it would be interesting, for example, errors, packet loss. And my thanks to LACNIC staff, who helped a lot in reviewing this document, and also to the people from Antel and PIT Chile that allowed us to check some of the specific cases we saw in Traceout that were not in line what we were expecting. And having said that, I would like to thank you for your attention and for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Agustin. Gracias. We have gracias questions Agustin. for Agustin. Any question, you can ask in Spanish, Portuguese, whatever you would like. Eh, no, hago solamente saber, porque no me quedó muy claro en dónde van a publicar el estudio, el documento completo. That uh, complete paper, the entire study. Yes, in the website of LACNIC, there's a section under uh, R&D that has technical reports. This is under interconnection technical reports. You'll find it there. Is it already there? No, it's, uh, um, uh, it's going to be there within a few weeks. It's undergoing the much. final review. Any more questions? Muchas gracias. Alguna pregunta más? Then a big applause for Agustin. Un Thank gran you very much for presenting. And we are at the end of the session, and there are the closing remarks, and there is the presentation, which is the same of them welcome. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed the, this session. And uh, I would like to remind you how to participate. We have a mailing list. Uh, in the mailing list will be also open every year a call for presentation. And we also have a mail for the chairs where you can uh, send us feedback. Uh, so uh, for sure, if you're doing research on the internet measurement topic, data analysis and uh, tools, please get ready for your next uh, session, which is going to be probably around May. Uh, so I would like to do some special thanks before to close. Uh, I would like to, first of all, thank all the presenters and our special guest as well, uh, Professor Fabian. Um, it was a really a pleasure to have all this presentation, but I also would like to do a special thank to our translator that we made them work uh, hard uh, during this session. In particular, Trinidad, Pauline, Cristina, Marise, and Stefani. A big applause for them. Applause. 
I would like also to thank I would like also to thank uh, um, Guillermo Cicileo for helping in the creation of this uh, working group and for guiding the R&D team in LACNIC. And of course, a special thank to uh, my co-chair Elisa, which actually she can join the, the stage with me. Thank you very much. We are uh, heavily over time, but I'm really glad that you stayed here with us and see you next time. Another picture. <laughs>